Hello guys, welcome to the Parson series and this will be part one of chapter number six. Now this is a very interesting one. Here we will be dealing with the clinical refraction and the refractive error. We all know that uh, refraction is a very important thing and especially the applied part or the clinical part of the refraction is a thing that you must know and the questions are also framed on this so we'll try to cover it elaboratively all right so first uh, they have actually started with the retinoscopy let's start with the retinoscopy the theory of retinoscopy retinoscopy is also called as the skyoscopy or the shadow test this is the practical method of estimating the condition of the refraction of first important thing is whenever they are using all the three of the words meaning will remain same retinoscopy skyoscopy or the shadow test now uh, principle now principle you have already seen in the previous chapter so many and beautiful elaborate principles of uh, the optics and refraction we have already covered there so the process actually begins with the uh, light so this it begins with the directing light into the patient's eye and we have to illuminate the retina the rays of light from the patient's retina um, emerge from the patient's pupil forming an image on the retina at the far point of the patient's eye so it will be going through the cornea then it is passing through the lens and um, here it will be passing through the pupil and ultimately it is forming this image on the retina that you already know now the location of this image location of this image actually depends upon the refractive status of the eye you know it will be in front of the retina in cases of myopia on the retina in emetropia and behind the retina in cases of hypermetropia so this will be actually estimated by moving that illuminated spot or slit because the retinoscope that we are using is either a spot retinoscope or we are using a slit retinoscope across the fundus and observing the behavior of this reflex by the observer in the patient's pupillary area so this is actually the basic principle that we are going to use in retinoscopy according to the refractive status of the patient the light reflex that is moving on the patient's retina or the fundus will be different all right now the light seen in the pupil is the blurred image of the illuminated area of the fundus why i actually i am seeing the light so that light is nothing but it is the blurred image of the illuminated area of the fundus as seen by the observer when accommodating for the observed pupil it is bordered by a shadow representing the edge of that illuminated area now the method therefore consists of so what is your method method is that we have to neutralize you have to neutralize this movement until the light is fully illuminates the pupil and you are not not seeing any shadow that is actually the basic principle of retinoscopy and uh, how you neutralize it by placing the lenses in front of the eye so we'll place the lenses in front of the eye uh, whatever be the nature of uh, the movement of the reflex according to that we will decide whether it is emetropia hypermetropia or myopia and we will decide what kind of lenses are to be given we place it in front of the eye until and unless light fully illuminates the pupil and you are not seeing any shadow there at this neutralization point what is going to happen so at this neutralization point the far point of the patient's eye will coincide with the location of the observer's plane and therefore it will be equivalent to the state of myopia equal to the dioptric equivalent of the working distance so this is the nothing but the straighter away the basic principles the physics uh, principles in the optics now if a surgeon is one meter away let us take an example the surgeon is one meter away because mostly we are doing the retinoscopy from a distance of one meter the combination of the optical system of the patient's eye so that means the uh, optical system the total optical system the patient's eye as well as the lenses will be equal to the one diopter of the myopia hence the patient's refractive state will be one diopter less than the lenses used to neutralize the movement so what what will happen refractive status is one diopter less because one diopter is the uh, lenses that you are using right now let us see the equipment the source of light for the instrument used for retinoscopy uh, this source of light could be external and directed into the patient's eye with the help of a mirror retinoscope it could be internal like uh, nowadays we have got self illuminated retinoscopes they are available by a bulb inside a self illuminated retinoscope so we will first start with the oldest one this was your prisley smith retinoscope we will be seeing this in the figure also now in this prisley smith retinoscope a mirror retinoscope such as the uh, this has a plane mirror at one end so it is actually a kind of 
mirror retinoscope which consists of a plane mirror at one end and it has got a concave mirror on the other. Now this mirror will project a circle of light into the patient's eye through the pupil and both the plane and the concave mirror have a central hole. This central hole is 2.5 millimeter wide anteriorly as well as it is 4 millimeter wide posteriorly fitted with a low power convex lens for viewing the reflex that, that is created. Either of the two mirrors can be used for the retinoscopy. So basic funda they have given you. Now this is the basic instrument. So I would say at least the pictures which have been given here are important and even if you do not know the uh, much details about these pictures, the recognition is very very important and that is why in my content I have tried to cover each and every image from this uh, whatever um, I feel was important, uh, each and every image has been included so that you do not have any uh, fear of getting a new image. So this is your Prisley Smith mirror retinoscope and this is your self illuminating retinoscope. Let us see. Now we talk about the streak retinoscope because mostly we are using the streak retinoscope only. A self illuminated streak retinoscope performs the same function but it is a streak retinoscope so this will be projecting a streak rather than circle of light and uh, this retinoscope illuminates an area on the retina. Now image on this portion of the retina is thus formed on the patient's far point of the eye the image will be formed. The observer does not exactly see this image but views the rays of light emanating from the illuminated retina. And these are seen in the patient's pupillary area from a convenient working distance. Now this uh, convenient working distance can be 1 meter or it can be 2 third of a meter which is actually 66 centimeter. Depending upon the movement of this luminous reflex observer comes to know whether the emerging rays are convergent or they are divergent or they are parallel. Now lenses from a trial set are used to neutralize this. So the basic principle is that we have to neutralize it and we have to see that which kind of lenses are actually able to neutralize it. The point of reversal or the neutral point of retinoscopy is reached. Now what is the point of neutralization? It is uh, reached when the subject's far point will coincide with the observer's nodal point and therefore the examiner will see a bright red reflex in the pupil eye and now you cannot see any movement so that is actually the neutralization. Now uh, mostly if you talk about the interpretation we have got three major interpretations in the clinical retinoscopy. One is if you are getting the uh, light is directed to the pupil into the myopic eye. So when the movement is in the opposite direction then when the movement is uh, in the same direction okay and then the third is your the third is that you are having no movement or no shadow is seen. So in this way we have got three kind of uh, results. So first one is when the movement is in the opposite direction. So if the light is directed through the pupil into a myopic eye, myopic means more than one diopter of myopia. So if the patient is having myopia more than one diopter, let me write here, if the myopia is more than one diopter then you get the against movement that will be in the opposite direction. So for the myopia I will be using a concave mirror, the other conditions remaining same then the shadow will be moved in the same direction as the movement of the mirror. So we can neutralize it with the help of a concave mirror. Now if the patient has a myopia which is exactly equal to one diopter, myopia equal to one diopter and retinoscopy is performed then no shadow will be visible and pupil will be either completely illuminated or completely dark. So there will be no movement while if the eye is hypermetropic the direction in which the shadow is moving is opposite to that of the myopic eye. Don't get confused that it will be opposite. It is actually in the same direction but opposite to the one which was seen in cases of myopic eye. So the movement will be with. So this will be with the movement and uh, if the eye is emetropic the direction will be same as that of hypermetropia that means in emetropia also you will be getting with movement. Movement will be neutralized by the trial lens exactly equal to the dioptric power uh, to the working distance which I, I told you it can be 1 meter or it can be 2 third of the meter any one we can use. Now a simple optical explanation is that the rays from a point of light in front of the eye illuminate a circular area of the fundus or a streak in the case of self illuminated streak retinoscope. So whatever source of illumination we are using we are getting that illumination in the form of a circle, a spot or a streak over the retina and this will vary in the size because you know uh, size is dependent upon the refractive status of the patient so it will vary in size. Now if the size, uh, if the source of the light is moved 
So when, when we are moving your retinoscope, so the source of light is also moving, the light on the retina will also correspondingly move and um, um, with respect to the direction in which the reflex is moving, we can decide that what is the refractive status of the patient. So I think that is pretty, pretty simple. Now in the hypermetropic eye, the rays reflected from the illuminated area emerging from the patient's eye in the hypermetropia, they will be divergent as if they are coming, because they are coming from a point which is behind the eye. We have got the posterior focus here. So this far point corresponding to the illuminated area will move in the same direction as the light falling on the retina. If an observer placed in front of the eye, look towards a point of light situated at posterior as the, at the position of the far point, but accommodates for a position of the observed pupil, a circle of light with a blurred margin will be seen not at a point because accommodation is not accurate for the far point. All right. Now, when the illumination of the retina <coughs> moves down, the circle of light which the observer see will also move with in the downward direction. So that is the same thing that in cases of hypermetropia, we will get with the movement. Now in cases of myopia, in cases of myopia, the rays of light reflected from the illuminated area will be convergent because they are coming from a point which is in front of the retina. So this far point corresponding to the illuminated area will move upward if the illuminated area is moving downward. So this will be going in the opposite direction. If an observer located in front of the eye and further it from the far point, look towards the observed pupil, a circle of light with a blurred image will be seen. So when the illumination of the retina moves down, the circle of light will move up that is in the opposite direction or opposite to the direction of the movement that was taking place in the hypermetropic eye. All right. Now in the, ob if the observer eye is one meter in front of the observed eye. So that means the distance between the observer and the patient is one meter. The letter has one diopter of myopia far and the patient has one diopter of myopia. That is a typical case. Then the far point of the observed eye will be at the situation of the observer eye only. This is a typical case of one meter distance and the one diopter myopia. And that is why a very slight movement of the light on the observed funders will throw the image at the far point of the observer's eye. So we can say that apparently the patient will not see any movement and either it will be completely bright or completely dark. So I can say that we will have three kind of a conditions, one in which the patient is having hypermetropia, another where the patient is having myopia and the third one where the patient is having myopia exactly equal to one diopter. All right. Now, if again the observed eye is emetropic, now they are taking when the refractive error is normal and the eye is emetropic, its far point will be at the infinity and it may be regarded as being infinitely far behind the observed eye. It's, it's very, very far behind the observed eye. Here again, there will be scarcely any shadow, although in reality, there is a very faint shadow, again moving in the same direction, same as that of the hypermetropic eye. So that means if I write it in one word, we can say that myopia when it is less than one diopter or it is emetropia or it is hypermetropia. In all the three conditions, I will get the with movement. I will get the with movement. While if the myopia is more than one diopter, I will get against movement. And if I am getting myopia equal to one diopter, then there will be no movement. So this is the simple formula. With the high refractive errors, the initial glow may be so faint that the direction of the movement is difficult to ascertain. One may have to empirically try a high plus lens or a high minus lens to see what type of refractive error and to proceed. Now sometimes uh, <coughs> we get a difficulty to find out uh, the amount of refractive error when the patient is having very, very high refractive errors because in cases of very high refractive errors, uh, you get a very, very faint glow. So that time you can empirically also try with the high plus lens or high minus lens and you, you can go with the trial and error method. Okay. Now, if the glow is faint, one can also shorten the working distance and use the concave mirror position to get a brighter image. Another, you know, trick is that if you are getting a very, very faint image, you can shorten the working distance, then you'll get a brighter image. You can use the concave mirror, then also you can get a brighter image. So these are two tricks that you can use. The movement of the shadow being a purely optical phenomena is of course independent of the cause of ametropia. Now, this is again important thing. Whatever is the cause of ametropia that does will not hamper that will not affect the findings of retinoscopy but the ultimate refractive status only will affect your retinoscopic findings. 
Consequently, in astigmatism, if one axis is hypermetropic and other is myopic, the shadow will move in the opposite directions in the two meridians. So, what they are saying that the cause does not actually is important. So, suppose patient is having hypermetro uh, this astigmatism, which is mixed astigmatism. In one, he is hypermetropic, another axis is myopic. So, in both the axes, you will get a different movement, and uh, both the um, uh, uh, axes will show you the movement of the reflexes in the opposite direction. Directions. Often the periphery of the cornea is flatter than the center. The correction of the refraction of the central part, which is more important, will differ from the peripheral part. These variations produce a very puzzling shadows in many cases. Now, you know that uh, if you look at the um, uh, steepening of the cornea and the flattening of the cornea, uh, uh, usually what you get that there is more steepening, more curvature in the center of the cornea and periphery is comparatively flatter. So, obviously, when you give the refraction that will also be different. They will not be same in the periphery and the center and that can give you sometimes different, different kind of puzzling reflexes. Okay. Now, we come to the actual practice of the retinoscopy. This is conducted in a dark room. Now, this is important because uh, many times uh, they say that uh, all of the procedures are done in the dark room except. So, you know that this is one of the dark room procedures and what is the working distance? This is one meter from a patient and it is uh, uh, also be used as a arm's length. So, arm's length distance is actually considered two-third of a meter. That is not a one meter. The patient wears a trial frame. This is your trial frame here. The patient, patient is wearing the trial frame and fixes gaze at a spot of light at the far end of the room so that he is not using his accommodation. A light may be placed behind and above the patient's head. And surgeon manipulates a plane mirror having a central hole through which he looks the reflected light or he can use the self-illuminating retinoscope also. So, we can use this mirror retinoscope also and we can use the self um, illuminating retinoscopes also. Now, if we are using a plain mirror retinoscope, then light is reflected into the eye and the mirror is slowly tilted from one to the other. And you have to see that what is the direction in which the shadow is moving. So, basically you are interested in the direction in which the shadow is moving. The horizontal meridian, uh, you know by convention we first see the horizontal meridian and then the vertical meridian and I think that is justified because horizontal errors are more common than the vertical ones. If the shadow appears to swell around not moving in the same meridian as the mirror, then that means the eye is astigmatic because you know uh, maybe the error is not same in both the meridians and mirror is not moving in a direction which corresponds responds to this axis and that means you are not working in the right axis and that is why whenever we actually treat astigmatism you have to first correct the axis only then you have to correct the power. A direction of movement can be found in which the shadow will move either directly with or against the mirror and uh, this will become the principal axis of the um, ast uh, astigmatism. So, if the uh, reflex is not moving particularly in with movement or in the against movement and it's just swelling around that means you are not working the right axis. So, you have to actually tilt um, these lenses in such a way that uh, now the uh, reflex starts moving either in with the mirror or against the mirror that means with the direction or against the direction so that now you will come to know that the axis is actually right and the other axis will be at a right angle. So, this is a very good and convenient method of getting the right axis in cases of astigmatism. Now, if the shadow moves with the error with the mirror progressively stronger convex lenses are put. So, with means I told you with means hypermetropia. So, you have to give the convex lenses until no shadow can be seen. Uh, if the stronger convex lens is now placed, so you are doing the over correction of hypermetropia. Over correction of hypermetropia will make it myopic and myopic will give you the against the mirror. So, this is a check proof method also that stronger stronger convex lenses you will go on putting. Now, till the time you start getting against the movement. So, that means that the previous one was the right one. The reflection has been over corrected and the point at which there is absolutely no shadow that will be the point of reversal. It is somewhat between the last two lenses and that the point of refractive error uh, of the eye together with the neutralizing lens in place will be equal to the one adapter of myopia. Now, the refractive error of the eye or the spectacle power required would be the power of the neutralizing lens minus one adapter. So, you will have to uh, minus it one adapter. Why? 
why we are saying that you have to subtract one adapter because see here what they are saying that uh, uh, if the point at which there is absolutely no shadow is your point of reversal and that is lying between the last two lenses and suppose you were using the last two lens was one adapter so you will have to subtract that one adapter and then you will get the ultimate power if for example the shadow can still be uh, seen to move with 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 the a plus 4 adapter lens in the frame and moves against with plus 4.5 we shall not be far wrong in considering that the point of reversal will lie somewhere between 4 to 4.5 so what is half this will be your 4.25 so point of reversal is at 4.25 so a lens of plus 4.25 would be therefore making an eye one diopter myopic so this will make the eye one diopter myopic so therefore refractive error will be your 4.25 uh, minus 1 diopter so effectively that comes to about 3.25 diopter i hope this is very clear to you so retinoscopic findings in the different refractive states now first of all they are starting with the spherical myopia okay spherical myopia hai means we have got simple myopia and uh, this uh, patient is having like minus 4 diopter eliminates the shadow against the mirror and minus 4.5 gives a distinct shadow with the mirror so we are having something in between so we are having something in between so with the mirror means that you were ha you are having the hypermetropia so we know that 4.25 will still leave the eye with minus 1 okay so now what will happen you will have 4.25 minus minus 1 adapter so this will become actually plus 1 so therefore minus 5.25 adapter will be there now in astigmatism each principal meridian is corrected separately this is very important in astigmatism you have got um, the different power in different meridians so each of them is corrected very very separately when one meridian is approximately corrected the shadow assumes the shape of a band otherwise it is swirling around the edge of the band being parallel <coughs> to the axis of the corrected meridian now even if the light is not moved in a direction accurately at right angles to this meridian the shadow still seems to move in the same direction but the shadow is moved most sharply defined if the mirror is moved at the right angle to its edge that is right angle to the corrected meridian you will get the sharpest image now the strength and the direction of the axis of the cylinder are then verified by placing the appropriate sphere and the cylinder cylinder in the trial frame and again seeing the shadow effects so this uh, keeping this um, what they are saying appropriate sphere and cylinder in the trial frame so they are actually talking about the refinement of the cylindrical error so this is actually the jackson cross cylinders we talked about the jackson cross cylinders in the classes so uh, it is the sparrow cylindrical combination that is used for the refinement of the cylindrical correction they are talking about that okay if there is any shadow in any direction the appropriate correction should be made further accuracy is achieved by surgeon leaning towards and then away from the patient you can lean towards the patient you can go away from the patient to see further accuracy repeating this observation in the first case uh, if you are going towards the patient the shadow should move in the same direction as the tilt of the plane mirror and when you are going away from the patient it will be moving in the opposite direction if the expected change does not occur in both directions that means your lenses are wrong okay so this was about the plane mirror now talking about the streak retinoscope in the streak retinoscopy what we are using in instead of the circular la, source of light as obtained by the plane mirror we are using a streak of light and um, here the streak effect is actually coming due to a plano cylindrical lens the appearances are more dramatic as the band of light in the pupillary aperture which is moving with or against okay now the axis of um, astigmatism is more easily determined with this on neutralization the streak will disappear and as i told you the pupil will appear completely dark or completely light okay so see this the first one is your completely dark or completely light you cannot see any movement here but here you can see with movement so this is also moving here and this reflex is also moving so this is your with movement while here can you see the reflex is move um, light is moving here and the reflex is moving in the other direction so this is your against this is your against movement and if you see there this is your no movement so i think this is very very clear picture is very very clear now the streak is passed across the pupil of the eye 
with the streak in a perpendicular orientation to the direction of movement when examining the patient's right eye, the retinoscope is held with the observer's right hand. Now, this is again by convention, like some people may use the other hand also, but it is by far the most uh, appropriate technique that if you are checking the patient's right eye, then hold it in the right hand viewed by the observer right eye only. So, everything right here um, and uh, the vice versa. When you are checking the patient's left eye, so we are using our left hand and our left eye but sometimes we like we may not be comfortable with our left hand or we are not comfortable with the le left eye the left handers may not be comfortable with their right hand so you you can change it as the streak is moved across the pupil now this light reflex will move with or it may be against or it can be neutral all the three responses could be there now if you see the aim of retinoscopy what is the aim of the retinoscopy it is to convert with or against movement into the neutral reflex. Now, whatever the reflex you are getting, either you are getting with reflex or you are getting against reflex, you have to convert it into a neutral reflex. This is accomplished by adding a lens of the required power manually or you can use a photopter also. And uh, the width of the slit reflected and its apparent speed, uh, it moves across the pupil, gives an indication of how far one is from neutrality because if, as you go uh, close to that neutrality, the, uh, you know, uh, the velocity will go on decreasing. But if you are uh, very, very uh, far, that will be high. A very wide, slow-moving reflex that almost fills the pupil denotes that a high refractive error and needs the addition of a high power lenses to achieve a neutrality. So what will happen if the patient is having very, very high refractive error, then you have to give high, high plus power lenses and uh, that means you are very, very far from neutrality. The streak uh, tends to narrow and uh, speeds up as the lenses of appropriate power and as you increase the power, as you go towards the neutrality, the speed will increase. Close to or to the point of neutralization the slit widens and here it moves extremely fast resulting in the visualization of fully illuminated or the fully dark area. So I hope these uh, concepts are very very clear. We have discussed some beautiful concepts of retinoscopy right from the plane mirror as well as spot and streak retinoscopes. What are the exact methods of doing the retinoscopy in both the things? What is with movement, against movement, no movement? How do you neutralize it? What do you mean by neutralization and how actually you will get to know that you are very near to the neutralization. In the upcoming things, we will be reading about the cycloplegics which are used in this um, retinoscopy, some of the important concepts of the uh, cycloplegics, what should be the choice of uh, cycloplegics, um, what you are using in the infants, what you are using in the young age group and how you do the postmediatic test. Um, one thing more, if you like the video, please do like the video, share the video amongst yourself as much as possible because you know uh, once you are doing a hard work I always want that uh, it should have the maximum coverage all those people who actually require this uh, it should reach to those people so uh, whomever you think that uh, may require this video please share the video please like the video and please do subscribe the videos to get the instant updates or notifications all of all the videos which have been uploaded here thank you and happy ophthalmology